Greetings and welcome to this edition of Campus Conversations. I'm Dan Mogulov from the University's Office of Communications and Public Affairs. Today we'll be talking about and taking questions about the planning, processes, and decisions related to the restarting of UC Berkeley's research enterprise. Our panelists include Vice Chancellor for Research, Randy Katz, Vice Chancellor of Administration, Mark Fisher, and two faculty members of the recovery management team that work to formulate the recommendations that are guiding the restart. And those would be Professor Max Alfheimer and Professor Susan Marcusi. We already have a number of questions from you that were submitted in the run-up to today's town hall. And those of you watching this stream through Facebook Live are welcome to post any and all questions you may have as we go along. We'll do our best to respond to all of them. Randy, let's start out with you and maybe just for people who haven't seen all the campuses met campus messages or are having trouble keeping up with the flood of information we're all getting these days about everything. How about a quick summary about what's been decided and where things stand right now? Yeah, well, thanks. Thanks a lot, Dan. Um, oops. Uh, thanks a lot, Dan. Uh, so I want to remind everyone that uh, it was about 100 days ago that the governor uh, uh, put forward a shelter in place order for the entire state. And uh, really we had about 48 hours to, to operate on that. And we had to shut down, you know, pretty much all activity on the campus as a result of that. Uh, now we're at a position a hundred days later of restarting activity on the campus. Uh, there has been background activity, uh, essentially keeping our research infrastructure up and running, uh, doing some very important uh, research related to COVID-19 rapid response and so on. Uh, over the last several weeks, we've been planning for a greater opening of access to our, our uh, research facilities and research activities on campus. I put together a task force of faculty members uh, drawn from all the different disciplines on campus, uh, professional schools and so on, to advise us. And in fact, to put together a document, which was what would be the appropriate guidance to our faculty investigators when they return to their spaces on campus to maintain the proper density and social distancing. And, you know, it's different in a chemistry lab than it might be in a physics lab or engineering lab, or even, you know, kind of an office or art studio space. So we needed to have this kind of domain specific uh, sort of guidance. We've developed that. Um, guidance from the campus recovery management team is that a work that can be done remotely should continue to be done remotely. So we have prioritized reopening the campus to access to those facilities that you really can't do from home. So our focus initially, of course, is on the laboratory intensive on campus kind of research that people want to do. I want to emphasize we have not forgotten about uh, other kinds of research, uh, research that faculty do from their offices by accessing the library, by accessing collections, by doing field research, human subjects research, and so on. But our first focus has been on that laboratory intensive on campus access. And I'm pleased to say that uh, we've now reoccupied for low density but active research about uh, 15. Uh, buildings on campus and generally the larger and largest uh, lab buildings that we have. And we expect to be open to about 30 buildings by the end of the month, which is just another week away. So that's so, where we are now. Yeah. So let me follow up a little bit before we turn to the other folks on the panel, because I remember when I first got the campus message, it talked by, about a step-by-step -step process. And now today you're announcing some 14, 15 buildings, which seems like far more than step by step. Is that a good thing? Or do you think we got started too quickly? Uh, no, I don't think we got started too quickly. Uh, you know, phase one was really this, this sort of maintaining essential uh, research capability, babysitting the equipment, babysitting the computers, and doing some essential research related to COVID-19. Uh, now we're moving into, as the state of California is, phase two which is opening up with restricted density, more activity uh, you know, within our spaces. The campus has, um, uh, Mark can correct me if I'm wrong, but you know, it's, it's uh, uh, in terms of major buildings, it's order about 80 buildings. And so 
uh, we're talking about at this point uh, 15 out of order 80 that are occupied. And I think, you know, the, the general guidance here is, is 25%. Uh, you know, kind of uh, bring the density in those buildings to 25% of normal. Start with 25% of our buildings that are the most lab intensive buildings and so on. So no, I don't think we're going too fast. I think we're kind of in keeping with the general increase in activity that's going on in the city of Berkeley, County of Alameda, and really generally the rest of the state of California. One more follow-up before I, I want to turn to Susan next. One more follow-up. What's What's the gating function? In other words, what's determining which buildings open and when they open? Are there certain checklists that building managers have to follow? How is that being determined and regulated? Well, l let me you know, sort of preface the answer to that question by everything we're doing is with the concurrence of the City of Berkeley Public Health Department. We reviewed our plans with them uh, in terms of their overarching goal is to maintain low density outside of the home, because let's not forget, there still is a shelter in place directive for the city of Berkeley where our campus is. And so we have to follow the, the sort of directions of, of the public health authority in the city of Berkeley, maintain low density. Now, uh, within that, we, we wanted to increase the amount of research activity that's going on on campus. And so what we did was to prioritize those laboratory intensive buildings first. Now to, to move into them, they have to be, it's, it's kind of like you leave your car on the street for a hundred days and you go back to it and the car doesn't start because the oil's leaked out and there's like, you know, sort of rodents have moved in. So there is a process for going through and preparing the buildings before you can reoccupy them. We want to check the water. We want to ensure that we have, uh, as is directed by the California State Department of Public Health, the necessary hand sanitizer and other, you know, sort of preparations for a safe reoccupation of the buildings, signage, uh, one person per elevator, all of those kinds of instructions. And frankly, that takes time. And it's really a shout out to uh, Mark Fisher and the people who work for him that have been running through these buildings, getting them ready for our researchers to return to them. And, and there aren't an infinite number of those people and they can't do what they do in a minute. You know, it kind of takes pretty much a half a day's effort to march through each one of these buildings. The fire marshal who has tremendous authority also has to go and review what's going on inside these buildings. Uh, the buildings must be safe before we allow anyone to go back into them. And that is a, a process that takes some time. So that's kind of the, the sort of set of checklists. Uh, we also, uh, the task force, and, and you're gonna get inputs from some of the members in a minute, they, they developed the guidance and also they helped us with the process for collecting from our faculty their plans for maintaining low density and uh, managing the number of personnel who are in their research spaces within these buildings. Faculty have, have gotten the guidance, they've filled out the forms, the forms have been reviewed and approved, that they have a plan for maintaining low density in those spaces. When we approve those plans, from our perspective, we're ready to let people back in. But from Mark Fisher's perspective, the building has to be safe. The custodians have to do their, you know, sort of cleaning schedule. We've got to get the hand sanitizer in the right places, the signs up. And then the fire marshal marches through and decides, well, the way you installed the stuff is within uh, standard safety boundaries. Okay, people can come back into the building. Great, we're gonna be diving into greater detail about all the issues you raised. Um, but Susan, let me, let me turn to you at this point. First, just tell us a little bit about your own discipline, your own, the sort of research you do, and maybe share with us a little bit the values and the principles that guided the work of the committee and what your impression, what you learned in what had to be an unprecedented process. Great, yeah, so um, I'm a biophysical chemist and I'm in the Department of Molecular and Cell Biology and Chemistry and work in a very multidisciplinary institute, which is Stanley Hall, part of QB3. And I was looking back, it was actually two months ago today that Randy contacted a bunch of us and said, would we be part of this larger um, task force? 
within that task force, there was a group of us that spanned mostly faculty, some staff that spanned the laboratory based research from physics, engineering, um, biological sciences, chemistry, et cetera. So we split off as a laboratory based task force and really thought about what are the common things we all do in our laboratory and, and what are the guidelines that we could put forth to faculty so that they could start opening their labs in a safe way. Um, in doing that, we realized that there were a lot of commonalities in terms of even the amount of space a person takes up in a lab at optimal working density when we're normally working in the labs at our full density. And so it was pretty easy once we realized that to say, okay, well, how much less should we go down to? We came up with some guidelines then where we could tell each laboratory based on the size of their lab perhaps, or based on um, the number of people that normally work in their lab, that was, uh, they were very general guidelines, what their budget density is, what we call it would be. And that budget density represents the number of people an individual laboratory could bring to campus. The details, and then we had guidelines about how uh, occupancy in particular rooms, how you might work if you had a chemical fume hood and another chemical fume hood next to that, how you might space that out to be safe. We tried to think about all the different types of research and core facilities we have. And we're scientists after all, most of us, that we've come up with guidelines that are very similar that we think should, based on what we know about uh, COVID and, and coronavirus, should help uh, minimize or stop the transmission in the laboratory. So we asked all of the faculty were given then these guidelines of their budget density and the occupancy limits in different rooms to come to us with their individual, to create as a lab, their individual protocols for how to do things. And that they would work on those in a very detailed way so that they understood between themselves. And then to fill out a form to communicate that at a very high level to the VCR, to Randy and the rest of the task force. And we could review those. And they're not, they're, while they are very specific, they do allow for people to change and be flexible because we realize that until we get back in the lab, we may not know the ideal way to do this. Um, so once those, those were what Randy was just talking about, once those were approved, we could also develop for each building. So ah, what we didn't tell you so far is each building has, is being opened and working as a unit with a building oversight committee. And so that building oversight committee works with Mark and other people to get the overall signage and, and issues about the elevators, but they've also created guidelines for how their individual community will work. And so one beautiful thing about Berkeley is that we are very interdisciplinary and we interact. No single researcher or a single lab really works on their own without interacting with other labs. So we had to set guidelines about how you could do that, how somebody could maybe enter another lab to be able to use a piece of equipment because they can't do that themselves. And um, so those guidelines came in. I should say the um, budget densities, how the different labs have used them have really spanned. Some people have decided to best do their science. They have shifts where they might have, say an average lab might have three people at a time. They might come in three different times during the day and that would accommodate nine people. Other labs feel that somebody should come in for a whole day and that they would go every third day or something like that, or maybe a week on, week off. And it depends on how you best need to get your research done. So they have, they have different ways of doing that. And then once all of that was up, we could uh, let people back in um, one building at a time. And I think for most of the buildings, the occupancy, we don't really know what the exact number of people that work there every day under normal circumstances, but our estimate is that we're working at about 20% right now. And uh, I work in Stanley Hall. It's a very large building at any one time, the budget density, there are probably about 130 people that could come to the building. Reports are it feels quite empty right now. And I'm also hearing that once they're in the lab and you know muscle memory, they've lost the memory of how to do their experiments. I think last week they took it very slowly. Let's just clean up, do the dishes we call it and get things ready. But that working in the lab is not very hard. They're able to do that because there's so few people in the lab without a lot of restrictions. And so the hope is we'll be able to get some really exciting new science and continue the old science that we were doing. Um, super. There are a number of things, um, a lot of bait you spread on the water that we'll try to <laughs> rise to, um, but I want to turn to Max at this point. Um, Max, tell us a little bit about your own area of research and 
what the process was like for you and what do you think is important for people to know right now, given the work you've done? Great. Uh, I'm an economist. I work on the impact of climate change on economically relevant outcomes. So most of my research is not done, you know, in a, in a lab like, uh, you know, many of my physical science colleagues do, but I do it out of my office in front of a computer screen. So I want to acknowledge that for all of us faculty and graduate students and postdocs and researchers who do research like this, uh, the past hundred days have been really challenging, like for everybody else. Uh, we're doing research in environments uh, that are very different from our usual quiet office spaces. So you can see in the background, I'm actually renting my son's room from him during the day in order to get uh, work done. So many of us, you know, work in, in, in multi uh, Zoom environments where spouses, partners, kids are learning from Zoom. Uh, we're in Zoom meetings all day and it is incredibly difficult uh, to get research done, new research, or you know, maintaining current uh, projects. So, what what we've learned uh, from email contact with many of my colleagues and talking to department chairs, there is quite a sense of urgency for many of our colleagues to return back into their offices in order to get the space, the quiet, uh, and just the time in order to to complete research. So uh, I certainly see you and I hear you. Uh, the issue here, of course, is that the city of Berkeley still does not permit office-based research on campus. So even if we wanted to, uh, we couldn't. So what are we doing about this uh, currently is uh, we're following uh, right behind the lab-based setup here, which was the first set of you know, research spaces to be opened here uh, to come up with processes that are parallel and frankly, a little bit simpler uh, than the lab-based uh, setups uh, to allow the reopening of some of the bigger buildings that have office-based research once the city of Berkeley uh, gives us the go-ahead. So the idea here is to be ready with plans that if we get to do it, we then don't start uh, work then. So we've started uh, similar things, uh, building committees for some of the bigger buildings in this in this landscape. We're working with Mark's team in order to figure out uh, what the needs are here. And we're going to engage with uh, department chairs in the relevant departments in the buildings very soon in order to develop uh, forms and procedures so they can request uh, access for their faculty. Office-based research is 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 different from the labs there is no you know pi that you know everybody else reports to is much less hierarchical so the way we thought about it is maybe a department chair is is takes on the role of the pi here and sort of tries to aggregate uh, what the needs are within the department and then in collaboration with the building oversight committees uh the Cognizant Dean's offices and uh, Randy's uh, Vice Chancellor for Research office, we would figure out what the safe, prudent way is to give the people who need access uh, the most access. I'll stop talking in a second. I think one thing we need to keep in mind here is that uh, equitable access to research spaces is incredibly important. It's not always the person that yells the loudest that, that, that necessarily needs the space the most. So we've been thinking very carefully about, you know, what are the needs of, for example, junior uh, faculty going for tenure or graduate students who are a year away from going on the market and uh, postdocs who have a year left. Uh, relative to, you know, somebody like me who is not happy about working uh, from home, but can uh, quite easily do do his or her work from home. Got it. Before I turn to Mark, I want to toss a question out to the um, the three researchers here, three faculty members, Randy, Mark, and Susan, uh, Max and Susan. So it sounds like there's this interesting balance between the center and the periphery or the units. Um, that some things are coming from the center and some things in terms of accountabilities and responsibilities are really being left to individual PIs or to colleges or to departments. How did you think about that? And how would you describe to those members of faculty and those graduate students and those staff members 
who are really just beginning to think about this, how would you describe that layout in terms of where decisional authority lies and, and accountability lies? Randy, maybe you want to start with that. Yes, uh, Dan, of course, I'll, I'll take a crack at answering that. So one thing that is really true about Berkeley is we're radically decentralized. There's a lot of authority uh, vested in individual faculty members, department chairs, and so on. Um, and this is such a heavy lift to bring back to campus 1,500, you know, in total, 1,500 faculty, 10,000 graduate students, 1,500 postdocs. I mean, the, the research workforce is enormous. And there was no way that this was going to be a top-down sort of allocation. So I felt it was very important that uh, we decentralize the decision making to the deans. And really, because we're talking about maintaining density on a building by building basis, that it should be essentially empowering of the occupants of the building to have the authority to establish the density given some guidance and the responsibility of uh, enforcing that density within the building's community. And so that's basically what we did. We did this with, you know, in cons consultation with the deans, uh, depending on the dean, they probably consulted with their department chairs. But at the end of the day, we established a building by building committee that has the responsibility and authority to uh, really set the boundaries, the guide rails for the density plans under the guidance that the task force developed. And then, you know, I think it's, it's community standards which are going to enforce that everyone follow those, those guidance. Susan, Max, anything you want to add to that about that balance between the center and the units? Uh, yeah, I'm happy to jump in there. I think, um, you know, nobody knows how to do their research better than the people who do it themselves. And, and they're the world's expert in it. And so uh, if we put guidelines that were too dictator-like, um, they might not actually be able to do their research. And so it's up to them. Everybody has safety in, in mind, but with the, the overall box in which they can play given to them by Randy and, and the task force, then I think it's more important for them to figure out how to work within that. And that was the, the decision that uh, we went with here. And I should say, we've read all of the proposals and operating procedures from the laboratories as they've come in. And it was really wonderful. In fact, um, pe people took this very seriously. And they were very thoughtful in terms of equity and safety and how they would make sure uh, people would be able to get science done. And so after doing that, at least in my building, we've made them available from one lab to another so that everybody is transparent sees how the working guidelines for everybody else and, and we can monitor each other and make sure that uh, we go forth. There's a clear uh, procedure if somebody is not being compliant with the guidelines, but I think a lot of that will be done as Randy said locally. Max, anything you wanna throw in? Yeah, I think we, we also have to think about knowledge of the physical space. So mm -hmm. I'm thinking in my universe, Dwinnell, most people have been in it. It's one of the most confusing buildings on, on campus. In the world. So how, what does a space budget mean? What's even a floor, right? Because there are these half floors. How do you separate things to make sure that space budgets are met? So we are working uh, with the facilities folks, with the faculty uh, uh, and, and chairs and department managers uh, to figure out what the right way to assign space budgets to these individual spaces is. And that's just something that is much harder uh, for Randy to know for every one of his buildings or Mark to know for all of the buildings at once. There's a lot of sort of local knowledge that I think comes in handy here to get this right. All right, Mark, your name keeps coming up in a lot of different <laughs> contexts. Um, talk to us a little bit about exactly your area of responsibility, how you got involved in all this and the whole cleaning uh, factor and, and how we're thinking about it and what our standards are and how we're gonna get done what we need to get done. Yeah, so um, you know we're really responsible for the operational portions of this. And for us, it was um, uh, really, taking what we learned, I would say, in really three events, the two PSPS events last fall. Hold on, let me stop you. Ac let me just, the acronym stands for? Uh, yeah, public safety and power shutdown that um, PG&E gave us as a gift last fall. Um, we learned a lot about how to operate the campus in a reduced fashion. And we had a lot of um, uh, help from 
research in terms of ramping down the campus then. So in the spring, when we had to ramp down, we were really pretty prepared to be able to do this. And I think if you think about how quickly the Berkeley campus did ramp down, um, it's pretty remarkable in terms of both um, uh, reducing campus population, going to remote content in terms of um, the academics and um, uh, reducing population again. So the same team that helped with all of that has been very key in ramping back up. So the group of people that we've put together, um, the Emergency Operations Center, or now we call it the Recovery Operations Team, they're really, I mean, they just have such amazing strength and ability to um, think through how we would make uh, the campus operational again. To all the points made earlier, this is complicated. I mean, we're talking about trying to keep people healthy. We're trying to, to maintain research on the campus, which we know is critical. It's, it, it's part of who we are, right? We're trying to think through what does it mean to add students back into the mix, especially undergraduates in the fall and the extra complication of classes being taught on campus and what that means in terms of population. So a lot of details in this and our team's work is really to work through those details and help operationalize what everyone else wants to do. So um, I'll take Stanley Hall as an example. We work, uh, worked closely with the team there to figure out a graphic system for the campus that could be used for that building as a prototype and then spread across the campus. But it tells you where to stand, where to wait, which hallway you use, um, uh, which direction you move in the hallway, which staircase you use for um, going up in the building or, or, or conversely down, fire exiting, uh, where the hand sanitizers will go, how they would be mount mounted. One of the things I learned, I should have known, was that the hand sanitizer actually has some uh, uh, fire marshal issues and it has to be installed in a very particular way. All of these details, working through all the logistics and making sure that we can clean, operate, um, keep secure um, our buildings during what is um, a very unusual time. So, Mark, I'm no scientist, but as we know, uh, what goes up can come down, and so we're talking a lot about reopening. And I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna open this up to the others. What about reclosing? What what are the criteria? What are the developments that could lead the campus to shut back down and how would that work and would it happen in a different way than it happened in the spring? So probably I'd start with external forces. For example, if there were a flare up in the virus, which we anticipate could happen this fall, that the state, the, the, the local health authority is actually in the city of Berkeley. It's a little unusual. Um, Dr. Hernandez, um, she could ask for us to, to move into a more remote content or have a different operational model. Uh, the governor could do this. Um, we could decide internally that if we had a major flare up of the virus that we wanted to do something on our own. Um, remembering back to the spring, Berkeley campus actually moved before the local health authority or the state. So, and that was really based on researchers on campus, looking at the mathematics of the virus and saying to us, you know, this thing is going to spread in this fashion. I, they recommended that we move fairly aggressively. That was in early March. And I can imagine, you know, in the fall, if we see uh, similar conditions where we have some major flare up, we would definitely have a conversation about um, what was the best strategy for the campus moving forward. Got it. Um, Randy or Max or Susan, any, uh, anything you want to add to that about the possibility of reclosing and how we're thinking and preparing for that possibility? Well, I, if I can uh, jump in first on this. So, you know, I think we did a really great job in terms of shutting down um, because it didn't, you know, it wasn't over a large number of days. Uh, we did, we were, we were planning it, we knew it was coming. And then, you know, uh, the governor uh, put forward his shelter in place order for the state uh, as executed by the city of Berkeley Public Health. So, you know, the shutdown, while we had like 48 hours to make it happen, I think we did a pretty good job of, of sort of doing that. And, and from that, we also figured out who were the people who need, continue to need essential access to, to sort of maintain our research uh, infrastructure capability. Now, in terms of, of building back up, uh, you know, again, the sort of parameter that we get to play with is the density of people on the campus. And so right now, Susan mentioned 20%, 25%, we're in that range in terms of our target for opening up this, this sort of next collection of buildings. If things go well, 
we could imagine, and you know, based on the instructions from the health department and from uh, the governor, could we increase it to 50% as things got better in the summer, you know, through the summer? I think the answer is yes. We can increase the number of people who are operating in our laboratories. We can open up more buildings. We can have people back in their offices. But that also suggests the way of ramping back down. So if there is the kind of external events that Mark is talking about, where we start to get instruction from the, the public health authorities, from the, the governor, to have fewer people on our campus, we can reverse that process. We can uh, schedule fewer people to be in those spaces at any given time. So we kind of have a parameter that we can kind of, as things are going well, increase, more people can be on campus, or decrease, less people can be on campus. And you know, I think we have a lot of experience. And of course we have the plans. Now we have the plans for the buildings we've opened up so far and we will collect it for you know, the rest of the major research spaces on campus. We have plans that say how you will manage your, your density. And with those plans, we're, we're tremendously empowered to be able to either increase the number of people, hopefully, or decrease it if we have to, because we have the mechanism in place. And where do faculty, staff, and students go to see those individual plans, Randy? Uh, I, I think Susan Susan mentioned that they, for Stanley Hall, they've made them transparent. Uh, you know, I, I can't imagine that there's any issue with having that degree of transparency on a building by building basis. Uh, you know, I don't know exactly where we are on the 15 or so buildings we've opened up so far, but in, in principle, there's no reason why those plans cannot be viewed. So is it safe to say, given that each building has a committee that's sort of responsible for its restart, that that will be the locus of information and guidance regarding that particular building? Absolutely, and uh, again, if there are any, any sort of uh, sense of uh, that there needs to be some kind of adjudication, I'm not happy with my allocation or that kind of thing. Uh, the building committee is really the, the sort of uh, authority of first, uh, first recourse in some sense in terms of addressing those. And I know as Susan has said, uh, in, there's a lot of awareness about uh, you know, being sensitive to junior faculty. Uh, we reviewed every single one of the, of the guidance uh, that went out in the sort of initial densities that were developed. And the question I asked every single one of, you know, our conversation was not a, was at the dean level for the buildings under the purview of that dean. Uh, I asked the question, have you considered, you know, what are you doing about junior faculty? Is it, uh, have you given any special consideration to them? And uh, the answer universally was yes. Good. So agree, you know, these plans are, you know, let round up in favor of the junior faculty member or, you know, sort of uh, make a consideration for the kind of work that they're doing where you can, you know, sort of make sense to have, uh, you know, a slightly larger budget rather than a slightly smaller budget. Those sort of considerations were weighed by the community that really understands the people in the building and what they do. So again, I think uh, there's, there is nothing in those plans that I would not feel absolutely proud for anybody to see. So, uh, you know, I think um, uh, having a general mechanism for making them available makes sense. Susan, so I can see you wanted to weigh in on that, but before um, we turn to you, I just wanna remind folks that are watching today that the end, at the end of this streaming event, um, I'll be sharing a website address where you can find detailed information about all that we're talking about today. Um, and also encourage any of you who are watching via Facebook Live to submit questions as we go along. Susan, it looks like you had something to say, please. Um, no, I was just going to echo uh, what Randy was saying about this tunable knob we have now to be able to ramp up and to, to close down and, and that these uh, shutdowns could be at the campus level, but they could be at a lab level. They could be at a building level, but now we were very thoughtful, I hope, in our doing this so that we could do that more nimbly and, and in a rational way to go up and down, it, you know, I think one of the more difficult things over the last week has actually been setting up these card key access and getting everybody in. It's a very technical thing that has nothing to do with research per se, but, but I think now we know how to do that. We have all of that in hand and, and we expect maybe something, maybe a lab for, for one reason or another is going to be shut down for a little while. So we can do that. As far as the lab plans, because we've been opening them one, a couple of buildings every day, each building has learned from the previous building. And so uh, 
in the first buildings, there was a way to transparently uh, show what each lab was doing, et cetera, within the building, where all the guidelines were, and that's been replicated in each building. Sharing them with everybody at some level is fine, but of course, I don't think the rest of the world needs to know that, you know, Susie's going to be in the lab from 10 to 4 at a certain day. So we do need to be mindful of, of what's put in there for communication purposes within the building and what is just the procedures by which we're going to follow. Um, I'm going to turn, so it's, I'm going to go back to some of the questions that, that have come in bef, uh, before this event for members of our faculty, as well as graduate students and staff. And this one sounds kind of specific, but I think it touches on a lot of issues that will be of interest and import to many of our faculty members. And here it goes. We haven't heard about plans for Berkeley Way West, where many of us have laboratories that conduct in-person research with human subjects. For those of us who do research with vulnerable populations, psychiatric and neurological patients, older individuals, there are additional safety concerns. What are the plans for restarting uh, research with vulnerable populations in our building, Berkeley, Berkeley Way West, and how will research rooms be kept clean and safe? Um, Max, let me just turn to you first on this and we'll kind of go around, everybody can kind of chip in as a response to that question. So I'm gonna I'm gonna punt this to, to Randy in a in Go a right second. Ahead. But the the interesting uh, thing here is Berkeley Way West is of course our our newest uh, I, I believe our our newest building for those members of the community who don't know where that is. It has an amazing udon place in the in the bottom <laughs> too. Uh, but uh, it's uh, it, it's occupied by multiple uh, departments. Uh, Psychology is in there, for example, uh, and this is one of these more complicated buildings in order to figure out how do we start that uh, that one back up. So there's computational stuff going on, there's human subject stuff going on. And on that note, I'm going to punt right to Randy, who's going to have a much better answer than I do. No, Randy. Max, that, that was not a bad answer. Um, first of all, you know, a part of our task force, uh, Dan, really did focus on human subjects research and developing guidance and guidelines for that. And we have uh, the necessary forms for collecting investigator plans. And of course, the way in which the investigator interacts with those human subjects uh, and how they maintain social distance and proper density management and proper, uh, if you would, COVID-19 hygiene is extremely an important element of what's captured in those plans. Uh, the optometry clinic on campus put together a very extensive plan to allow, which was reviewed by the way, by the city of Berkeley public health department uh, in order to, you know, allow them to reopen uh, and, and in part because of the nature of the close proximity that a clinician has to come to a optometry patient. Um, and so there is a way to do these things. There's a way to capture, you know, the necessary procedures and so on. What, what is, is sort of, uh, uh, you know, sort of occupying our time right now is working our way through those lab intensive on campus research intensive buildings. And we've already even, you know, uh, as a next step, of course, we want to be able to open up the campus to, to other kinds of research activities like the stuff that Max was talking about, allowing faculty members to return to their offices for research. Human subjects research, we want to be able to, you know, sort of reactivate that as well. But the complexity comes from the fact that those human subjects are not part of the Berkeley campus community. They're coming from outside the Berkeley, the Berkeley campus community. And, and we have to follow the guidance of the public health directives first before we can allow those third parties to come to campus. The optometry clinic demonstrates that it is possible to have that conversation with the city of Berkeley Public Health. And we intend to do that once we get through this, this sort of heavy lift of opening up the lab intensive buildings. But um, there is some issues there about, uh, and I know Mark has been involved in some of these conversations as well. For every third party we allow to come to campus, there's a, a sort of graduate student, postdoc, faculty member or staff member who under the current directives cannot come to campus. And so there are going to be some priorities, but I want to assure people who do human subjects research 
that uh, we, we are aware of their needs and we want to, you know, sort of work as expeditiously as we can to allow them to continue their sort of work on campus. But our priority will be to minimize the density of individuals on campus, prioritize our own campus community over third parties. And uh, nevertheless, as part of that, to give some priority to uh, human subjects who are, whose health and well-being are directly benefited from their participation in our human subjects research. And that actually is currently allowable under the guidance from the city of Berkeley and the state public health authorities. And that's why the optometry clinic, once we developed our plan for how to maintain the distance and hygiene, it's, it's actually completely within the scope of what the city has been, you know, sort of telling us to do. We, we need a further conversation with the city and a, you know, sort of campus level recovery management team to set, set out the priorities of who, who is permitted to be on campus given the density guidelines that we have from the city of Berkeley. So Mark, let me turn to you with the next one. We've got a lot of questions that are about safety and well-being. People's concerns are completely understandable. So first, let me drag you into the weeds on the cleaning front. What standards are we cleaning to? How many times a day? How, how do we? How did we determine how clean we need to be? For example, yeah, that's a great question, Dan. Um, and the guidance on this is clear as mud, I would say. So <laughs> we are moving toward cleaning twice a day, and we are raising our cleaning standards. There are APA cleaning standards that uh, physical facilities groups across the country use. We were at about a level four. We're pushing to level two, which is pretty high standard, and um, uh, we will clean at that level twice a day. Now, going back to the Berkeley Way West question, um, one of the questions that came up in all this is how are research spaces clean? So right now in the cleaning model, we're cleaning through facility services, all the high touch areas, hallways, bathrooms, doors, um, the things that the public moves through. Then we're supporting the laboratory research by additional trash removal and support in that way and providing materials, cleaning uh, materials for the researchers to use. So I think even when we get to human subjects, there will be a big question about who does that cleaning between subjects or in the spaces where someone might um, interact with the campus. And my guess is the researchers will still have part of that responsibility as they do in the, the laboratories that we're currently opening. Um, we are also looking to, at limiting the number of buildings that are open in the fall. Um, I think Randy mentioned 80% of the campus space. We think that we can, um, and this takes additional resources, with additional resources meet the cleaning standard I just described for 80% of the buildings. So one of the discussions we're having now and will be an ongoing discussion is what buildings are in the 20% that aren't open? And this goes back to something Max said, where I think there'll be some level of discomfort if a building that um, someone typically uses isn't going to be reopened in the fall. And I think we just have to look for accommodations for those that, that might be in a closed building so that they can work somewhere else if they have to. So there are a lot of details around the cleaning. It's extremely complicated. Um, it does entail us potentially having to hire more people to meet this cleaning standard. Uh, a number I've heard is as high as 100 additional custodians for the campus. Um, clearly, as we look at resources, especially our staff resources across the campus, we'll want to um, uh, make those positions available to those who um, might be in an area with an impacted budget so we can uh, preserve as much of the staff as possible. So we're also, I'm not sure which of you are best positioned to answer this one. We got a question about PPE, personal protection equipment. And in fact, even more detailed, whether we'll be handing out branded, Cal branded PPE, so people will know who's with us and who's not with us in terms of people who work on campus or don't work on campus. Who can answer the question, the PPE question? Maybe, Dan, I'll start with the branded PPE. We did have a very generous um, gift from a donor and we ordered 250,000, um, did I do that right? No, 120,000 masks, I doubled it uh, for the campus, basically two for every uh, for the population basis. We have 60,000 on campus and they're branded with Cal on them and those will be made available to the campus. Got I'll start it. there and Randy or someone else can jump in yeah. on the PPE for the laboratories. 
you know, I understand, uh, Mark, that those are face coverings as opposed to masks. Sorry, so, yes, you're right. Yeah. And uh, yeah. also our environmental health and safety organization has been able to uh, uh, stockpile, you know, it's become, it's become more available. Uh, the N95 masks and surgical masks. And and I, I, I forget the exact numbers that we have, but there are many tens of thousands of these things. And I want to assure people uh, we haven't stolen them from, you know, frontline responders. This is, uh, you know, the supply of this kind of uh, material has become more available over the last, you know, sort of several weeks. And we've been, you know, sort of uh, the university and, and all of the university campuses through UC has been, you know, sort of power power buying, uh, you know, these kinds of supplies. So I think we have adequate supplies for our laboratory spaces of things like masks and gloves. Um, we are increasing the amount of, uh, uh, you know, sort of uh, in many of our laboratories, people wear the traditional scientist, scientist white coat. And I know that we have uh, upped the cleaning cycle on those uh, in preparation for reopening laboratory research. Um, uh, so I, you know, I think generally we're in a good, very good condition uh, in terms of having uh, both the branded face coverings that will be available for our general population on campus and the, the necessary PPE for our laboratory spaces. And where do people go for more specific information? There are a number of questions here. Um, what steps is the university taking to ensure the health and safety of, of researchers? What about protocols? What if we have visitors? Should we wear a mask? Should we wear gloves? Um, without going into all the details, I think the most efficient thing would be, where, where do people go to get those guidelines about how they need to roll when they're on campus in their labs? Yeah, well, I would say that uh, our research, you know, the VCR research website has a COVID-19 uh, page where we can collect a lot of this information. Actually, you know, every single one of uh, the vice chancellors or vice provosts has, has such a page. But there is, there is a, you know, we will provide uh, in that follow-up that you're going to make available, Dan, the, the pointers from uh, our website to, you know, sort of all of this uh, information and the other websites that are around the campus. Perfect. So again, uh, Susan Hangsite, um, I'll be right there. Just again, I'll be at the end of this event posting uh, the website address that Randy referred to. And I'll also be asking our colleagues in the Vice Chancellor Research Office to take whatever questions we don't have time for today and to slip them into an FAQ so we can provide the information folks are looking for. Susan, please go ahead. I just wanted to clarify that anybody who's been cleared to come onto campus to date has already been given that information about the guidelines, how to work in their lab, all of those guidelines that Randy's referring to were given to every single person that before they can come to campus. So, so they have those. The other thing I just wanted to add is we have these branded um, face coverings, et cetera, but as scientists, many of us are, are wearing PPE already. This is something we're comfortable with. And so not everyone on campus will necessarily have a Cal branded uh, face covering, but there will be an option to. Is that correct, Mark? That's correct. And, and if you're not, if you're walking across campus, we encourage you to wear the face coverings everywhere. So we're, we're hopeful that uh, uh, everyone will follow the guidelines from uh, the health department and wear those face coverings inside buildings, but also outside the landscape. So, um, Max, let me come to you with the next question. I mean, I, I'm seeing some questions here and we've heard some comments in the past that sort of expressed concerns that we're creating pressure to return, that obviously they're very different perceptions of what constitutes acceptable risk on an individuated basis. What's, what's your response? What do you say to people who are going, eh, not so fast? If you can do your research from home, stay at home, do your research, right? This is, uh, we're managing a very small amount of space here to give people who need it most access to the facilities they need to do their research. Uh, so I think the issue here is nobody on this call or anywhere else, I haven't been in a single meeting and I've been in, in as my colleagues here, I've been in hundreds of these, have I heard the words uttered, we need more people on campus. It's, hmm. it's the opposite, right? Hmm. So we're trying to encourage people to, you know, stay at home if they can, but 
on the other hand, you also see, you know, imagine yourself, you're a fourth, fifth year assistant professor, close to tenure, you're running experiments, you know, it takes a year to get a paper out. You require whatever lives in your lab to do your, your research. You can't do that from home. You need access to a, a campus research uh, facility. Uh, and, and the current mechanisms provide a way for that person to get access to that research environment. Uh, one thing we have to be, of course, very mindful of is that there's no perceived pressure by, you know, graduate students and, and, and postdocs that maybe because of a, an, a health concern or something don't feel comfortable coming to campus, that they don't feel like they're, you know, being volunteered uh, by their, their PI to come to campus without, without giving consent. So we've been very mindful of that and very careful to make sure that the person asking for access actually wants uh, access. But this is clearly, as in, it is in any institution, any corporation, if you, if you have a boss, there are sensitivities there that you wanna make your boss uh, happy. But this is a, a, you know, we've all read about the public health consequences. We've learned things about, you know, values of contagions and statistics. We never thought we would know things uh, about there's still no vaccine, right? The situation hasn't changed uh, in that sense at all. Uh, the only thing that seems to have worked, and of course, uh, there's this wonderful paper in, in, in Nature by uh, my colleague Saul Shang from the Global School, uh, Goldman School of Public Policy that showed that a lot of these shelter in place policies led to a massive uh, decrease in, in, in infections. So uh, staying at home, is something that if you can do it, you should do it. And you're not gonna see any pressure from anybody here to, to return to campus if you don't have to. Super, let me throw out a scenario that is embedded in one of the questions that we received and that you know we go back to work and we're in our building, we find out somebody who also uses that building is tested positive. What happens? How will people know? What will the response look like? Not sure who of you, Randy, do you wanna take first shot at that one? Sure. Uh, there actually is a process that has been defined as a flow chart, if you would, of what you're supposed to do. But at the highest order, it's notify the University Health Service. There are doctors on campus. They are, are you know, sort of interface to the public health system. And they're the people who are the ones that are, are really uh, connected to the network of uh, experts uh, related to this. Um, don't forget that, you know, we've had some, some cases earlier in the year where individuals affiliated with the campus uh, were tested positive in another jurisdiction. Uh, and uh, in following up, those individuals had never stepped foot on the campus. But it was important for us to know um, uh, these kinds of things. So there's a, there's a big communication that's happening essentially, uh, uh, you know, between a university health service, uh, public health uh, authorities and so on. So that's the place to start. And we have a defined process to, you know, sort of what to do. Is the person, you know, were they working in the space? Where were they? Uh, you know, what our cleaning protocols are for, you know, sort of uh, dealing with uh, that kind of revelation. Um, Mark, do you want to say anything about, you know, sort of what the cleaning steps are following? I think it really depends. Randy's absolutely right on, on what the conditions were. And one of the cases this past spring was um, uh, we thought the person might have been in our buildings had they been in the buildings. Um, we, we would have gone into a deep cleaning mode. We possibly would close the building. Um, in this particular case, the person hadn't been here, as Randy said, so we, we were able to avoid that. We can all assume this fall that it, should the virus um, uh, flare up or we know the virus is still around, we're going to have a case where we have to go into a mode to deep clean. Um, clearly, in the research endeavor, we we'll want to work with the researchers to understand what's in the laboratory, um, what the best process might be to clean that lab. We've bought equipment, special equipment that you can use. It sort of atomizes a cleaner. Um, it, it basically uh, permeates the entire space and can um, sanitize the space. We have those machines available both in facility services, EHS, and I think that housing um, RSSP also has that technology. So we're, we're prepared for this. We just haven't had to do it yet. Um, our colleagues around the UC, I know that you see Davis right now, they're dealing with a case. And so um, it, it, it will happen. 
during the course of the fall, I'm certain. So the next question is, um, was sort of oddly comforting to me because it said that no matter what's happening in the world, no matter how unprecedented it is, it is parking will still be an issue on the UC Berkeley <laughs> campus. Um, and so I'll give you one question and please take it and address any other comments you may have received or heard about parking. This one says, as we now begin to reopen buildings and resume research, will there be anything done to mitigate the cost of campus parking so that it is more affordable for those of us who commute but do not want to access public transportation for fear of exposure to COVID-19. I know there's also questions from graduate students who are usually restricted to certain lots, which are quite distant. So who can take, Mark, do you wanna start, talk a little bit about parking, what we're thinking about, what we're doing and the extent to which we understand these concerns and are hoping to address them? So, so what we've already done to date, Dan, is we have special summer rates in place. Um, We've tried to, uh, okay, let me start with the rates. So there's a $6 a day permit, which typically would not be available during the academic year. And if it were, I think you're only eligible for a certain number of them. Um, there's also a 50% per hour rate that you can dial on your phone and pay uh, via that mechanism. And there's a special weekly um, rate as well. So we've reduced all the rates to try to make it more affordable. And then based on comments from Susan and others, um, we've tried to make sure that the parking lots that are available to students, graduate students, everyone in the population of the campus are proximate to where they're working. So um, we had garages on the south side of campus, but we didn't have good coverage on the north side. So we made a provision that spaces are available now in the lower Hearst garage. We will continue to evaluate our parking demand. And if we can produce and provide proximate parking to more of the population, we will do so. Um, I think it's just really looking at the lots and figuring out you know, typically who would be um, uh, eligible for those lots, uh, making sure that they're not disadvantaged, but then if there are spaces available that we take advantage of that and make those available to our, our, our especially graduate student population, but truly everyone. And we, we certainly understand the concern about riding on public transit. Um, there's some good research. There's, there are articles in the paper all the time now about um, uh, the level of risk in this area. Um, realistically, we know that we, we, we have to make accommodation for more people potentially parking on campus this fall um, and, until we feel comfortable that transit is, is, is safe enough to use again. And I think we've, the transit rates here have dropped by 75%, if I recall correctly. Anything else to add from that, Randy, Susan, Max? No, I, you know, again, uh, I know that there's some concerns about, uh, you know, security in our buildings and working at night and so on. And I think really Mark and his team have been very uh, sensitive to that. Uh, we have campus programs that can escort individuals, you know, back to their cars at night. Don't forget that those exist. Um, and also Mark pointed out uh, that, uh, you know, the, the sort of near in lots that are typically central campus uh, are available during, you know, sort of after 6 p.m. or at nighttime for uh, anyone with a permit. Um, so, you know, I think, I think there's a lot of opportunity for accommodation to allow people to drive, have their car close to where they're working and to feel secure in, in the work that they're doing on campus. We have time for just a couple of more very specific questions. Um, here, Susan, here's one for you, I think. Um, Somebody asked, can we just get to our office to grab our desktop computers for home purposes? If not, will Berkeley provide the, the material or the equipment that we need? Um, yeah, I can address the first half of that question. And that's been asked a lot. And um, even within the buildings that are open, not everyone has access. If you are a theoretician, you might not even work in a laboratory-based building. Your card key has not yet been activated. So my understanding, and Randy will correct me if I'm wrong, is that the various buildings have a point person for someone to call and they have a procedure, may it be a certain time once a week or whatever, to let you into the building to get what you need. So I don't think there's any expectation that anybody should not have access to their laptop, a book, et cetera, but that they should be doing their work that can be done remotely. remotely. Got it. Um, what about... Add one sure. thing, because I do think in your question about testing, there was an inherent, will I know if somebody in my building? And, and the answer is you may not. And we have contact tracers. And so if you need to know, you should assume you will be told, but mm. you can't assume that 
you're just going to know everything about what happens in a building. That's not the, the way it works. So I think it, it, we have to live with that uncertainty and that we're doing everything we can, assuming that's why we're wearing masks, that there may be some virus in the building and you're doing your best to protect from it. But if there is an outbreak in the building and you have been in a situation where they think that's a risk, you'll be contacted. I and, 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 and am I safe in assuming that the reason you may not know is that that sort of health information is legally protected private information, right? Correct. Correct. Okay. Last specific question um, about sort of uh, how we're about the restarting process. It's about field research. Somebody asks, where do we stand on field testing? Does that have to wait until on-site testing can begin? Or are we able to conduct studies at a safe distance in open places such as parks? Randy? Yes, uh, I, I, I'm interested that you, the word testing somehow got in there, but I think it probably meant, you know, sort of field research. Um, the answer is we're trying to, to really uh, parse the, the city's directives with respect to essential travel. Again, I want to emphasize that the city of Berkeley, and as far as I know, Alameda County uh, and Contra Costa County, and really all of the Bay Area counties continue to operate under a shelter in place order. You're supposed to be outside of your house only for essential things, but essential things are, are expanding. So uh, city of Berkeley just in the order as of Friday, the 18th, which was just a few days ago, opened up access to outdoor museums, uh, outdoor gardens, including, you know, things like our botanic garden. And so we're assessing, you know, what guidance we should have to permit field research in the context of, you know, can we justify it as essential travel under the way in which it is specified in the, in the orders from uh, the public health authorities. If you're traveling to another county that's maybe more loose in its restrictions than city of Berkeley, is that okay? Uh, so we're working our way through that, and I expect that we'll have, you know, some really, really uh, appropriate guidance very, very shortly, and I expect that we'll be able to open up field research in the near future. Um, Randy, last question for you, um, which is related to this in sort of an indirect way, but talk to us a little bit about what you've noted insofar as the work faculty are doing across the campus in specific response to the pandemic the kind of research activities underway that are helping to facilitate greater understanding and a better response to the pandemics that's sweeping across the world right now. Yeah, it's really, uh, really amazing to see the way in which our faculty have responded to this, you know, sort of global challenge um, in many, many different ways uh, from uh, the uh, researchers in the Innovative Genomics Institute uh, basically turned a screening facility um, for, for studying, um, you know, sort of uh, the, by looking at a lot of, of uh, genetic variations to understand the behavior of those, uh, those organisms under genetic variation to the environment in which they're being tested. They turn that facility around almost on a dime for a COVID-19 testing facility. And it was just announced broadly that members of the Berkeley campus community that are returning to campus, authorized to return to campus can be tested just by, you know, just schedule an appointment and you'll be tested using uh, a developing testing method that they have been working on in IGI based on saliva testing. So no more, you know, sort of a thing up your nose. Uh, this is just spit in a test tube more or less in order to, you know, collect a sample. We have members of our faculty that are infectious disease experts looking at deep understanding of how COVID-19 works. We have a large number of our biological and life scientists looking at things like other cures uh, or therapies that have been developed for other, uh, you know, SARS-like uh, viruses. Are they efficacious in dealing with the current uh, you know, sort of outbreak. So a lot of rapid response research. Our engineers have come up with low cost designs for ventilators and 3D printing of swabs and, you know, uh, uh, machines that can do sort of bulk uh, sanitation or disinfection, I should say, of PPE. It's remarkable how the faculty and researchers on campus have stepped up. 
Super. I wish we had more time. We don't. I want to thank all of you for what has been a really very informative discussion. Um, and now if I could ask our colleagues at Educational Technology Services to put up on the screen the graphics so we can tell people where they can go for additional information. Um, first of all, just generally speaking, I'm gonna give them a chance to catch up with me here. I should also note, we got a number of questions from students um, and those questions really are have to do with instruction. And if you do have questions about instruction, you wanna to go to the registers website. I don't know if that website address is up on the screen right now, but you can search for registrar um, at UC Berkeley or registrar.berkeley.edu. For those of us watching today who want additional information um, specific to uh, the restarting of the research enterprise, you can either go to the Vice Chancellor Research website that's up on the screen now. You'll see there's a specific COVID related site, but you can get there off the main landing page. Um, for general information about the campus response, and again, it's sort of a portal to all sorts of other areas, news.berkeley.edu, you will find a great deal of coronavirus information, everything from housing to financial aid to the research issues we've been talking about today. Um, and then finally, uh, this coming Thursday, the day after tomorrow, we're going to be what it will be the last of a series of town halls related to our plans for the fall. This one has to do with student affairs and student engagement. We'll be going deep into the details around financial aid, housing, extracurricular activities, issues of great import to our students and their families. And that'll be this Thursday from 5 to 6 p.m. Um, and with that, again, I want to thank our panelists today and thank all of you who tuned in and to remind you to keep your distance, stay safe and be well. Thanks.